Welcome to our final faculty seminar for the fall 2022 semester. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our colleague, Elie Bouzade, professor in the Department of Civil and Enviro Environmental Engineering. Uh, Ellie uh, is, focuses on atmospheric sciences, uh, uh, meteorological processes on, in, a, in, in a part of the atmosphere that is incredibly relevant to all of us, sort of the, the planetary boundary layer, where we all live most of our lives, unless you are somebody that flies for fun or uh, goes on airplanes, right? Those, those brief periods that we go in the stratosphere on a jet plane, or if you, if you fly uh, for pleasure, you can stay in the upper troposphere. But uh, Ellie focuses on this part of the atmosphere that is in, in contact and exchanges with the land surface, uh, both the natural and the urbanized part. Um, Ellie is, uh, uses a variety of methods. He uses field programs, observations, but also basic theory and uh, modeling and it, uh, at a scale that for those of us that do global modeling is, is really outstanding. It's, it's uh, on the scale of kilometers, meters, the resolution, right, that you're running at. Uh, and, 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 and really, the, when you look at the layout, you actually see the buildings, very, very bizarre. It, uh, I, I would, I, you know, we say high resolution when we're talking 25 kilometers by 25 kilometers, which is your full domain. Right. Uh, anyway, so, so, so it's great to have uh, someone like this to interact with. Uh, a bit about Ellie. Uh, he recently stepped down as chair of the Metropolis Initiative at Princeton. Uh, he received his PhD and a master's from John Hopkins University in first in mechanical for the master's and then in environmental engineering, right, for the PhD. And prior to that, had done both a bachelor's and a master's in mechanical engineering at the American University in Beirut. Uh, Ellie has received a number of awards, but, and you'll see this is a common theme with many, I think practically all of the speakers in our faculty seminar series, he also got, he received an outstanding teaching uh, award from Princeton, from his department in Princeton. So our faculty here are not only amazing scholars in producing research, but also committed to teaching and do a good job. And so we're going to have a great show. So with that, Ellie, please take it away. Thanks a lot, Gabe. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. <clears throat> thanks, Gabe, for inviting me to give this talk. I go around and give this talk to many national and international crowds. But it's always uh, very good to actually be able to uh, talk a little bit about my research to my home crowd. So uh, the talk is about how humans, infrastructure, and nature shape the emerging environment in cities. And this emerging environment is what I define as the urbosphere. So <clears throat> what is the urbosphere? This is Shanghai in 1980 versus 2010. You see that the landscape has completely changed. The land surface has changed completely. With that change in the land surface, there's going to be changes in the temperature and chemistry of the air layers, uh, changes in the water bodies that we sometimes build ourselves in the cities. So when you think about a, a transformation like that, it's going to create a new environment where the surface, air layers, water bodies, and even snow cover in, in some cities uh, have dynamics that are largely controlled by the environment that humans design and by our activities. So it's completely different from all the other sphere we uh, usually uh, study. This is why I am uh, basically uh, trying to uh, push this idea of, of a new sphere, the urbosphere. Now, the urbosphere is also expanding, um, unlike the cryosphere, unfortunately, which is shrinking. But this is uh, Phoenix in 1910 uh, versus basically uh, 2010. You see how fast the city has expanded from a little town to become a, a large metropolis. And this is a story of Phoenix that's also repeated in many other cities all around the world. So by 2050, about 70% of the world population will live in cities. Compare that to the turn of the century where it was about 45%. And cities today, despite uh, only uh, having about 58% of the population, I would say, 
uh, are estimated to emit 75%, uh, 80% of the greenhouse gases and about 80% uh, or, or, and use 75% of the world energy. So basically, cities are where the grand challenges uh, that we are facing will either be overcome or not. So they're extremely important. Cities, in fact, are basically the interface between, um, or the urban environment is the interface between natural system and human-made system. As Gabe was mentioning, the ABL is where we live, and, and basically 70% of us will be living in this urban ABL very soon. Now, to, to account for this increasing, uh, increasing population, the infrastructure uh, will double roughly by 2055 compared to 2015, which means we'll have the double the number of buildings and, and roads and all of that. So that might be scary, but it's also an opportunity. If we manage to design, plan these new buildings and infrastructure while advancing environmental quality, sustainability, resiliency, equity, and livability, we will basically make uh, our home planet a better place, and then maybe we don't have to colonize Mars. Now, we want to design these infrastructure for 2055, and when you want to design, you want to understand what are you designing for. Now, this is why we need to understand this urban environment. So, paraphrasing Tim Oak, the urban heat island is the most well-documented and severe modification of the climate. Now, this is dated, seeing what's happening today in the polls, maybe it's the second most well-documented and severe modification of the climate, but it remains a very important one. This is why over the past multiple decades, uh, Tim Oak and uh, many other people, uh, including my lab, we've been trying to understand uh, urban climates at long scales as well as, as well as urban meteorology at a small scale to understand what, are we, what is the environment we are designing this infrastructure to operate in. So to start understanding this environment, you have to understand the drivers uh, at the start at the surface that modify this environment compared to a natural one. So there are radiative drivers. We use asphalt that's very dark. We use complex surfaces where a ray of light, instead of just being reflected one time, uh, is reflected and absorbed multiple times. That leads to what we call radiative trapping. There's also material drivers. We use materials like concrete that have no equivalent in nature. It stores heat for an incredibly long time. Um, there are metabolic drivers, for example, human activities such as space heating, uh, space cooling, combustion. Uh, they uh, are going to release a large amount of anthropogenic heat and pollution into these cities. There's geometric drivers related to the shape of the cities that lead to radiative trapping, but that also slow the wind on average and may be accelerated in some locations. And then finally, there are extremely important eco-hydrological drivers where the lack of pervious soils and vegetation in cities is going to reduce evapotranspiration, which cools the cities. Um, and uh, sometime when we uh, plant, uh, especially when we plant uh, uh, trees and, and uh, other vegetation that's completely non-native to the area, we can really be uh, planting uh, 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 species that uh, emit biogenic VOCs and, and other chemicals that are uh, basically uh, going to change the local atmospheric chemistry. So that's the heat picture. The, uh, the air quality or atmospheric chemistry picture is similar. We emit uh, from cars, from indoors. The pollutants are trapped. We have some industries. And again, we have these bio, uh, biogenic emissions. So these are all the drivers that we know so far and we've documented well cause urban heat islands. They modify precipitation and the urban water cycle as Gabe uh, himself actually has done and, and, and studied uh, 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 over the last years. And they also modify the ecology and the biogeochemical cycles. And this is, these are the changes that are local due to land use. But also at a global scale, we know that greenhouse gases are having a similar or parallel impact. On the temperature, they're going to increase the intensity and duration of the heat waves. They're going to change precipitation and evaporation patterns. And they're going to also affect ecology, biogeochemistry, and atmospheric chemistry. And as a result, we as humans are going to face a superposition uh, that actually might be more than a superposition, as, as we have so shown of these two, uh, two threats, so we need to understand how their impacts will interact or not, uh, and especially during the extremes, for example, during heat waves. 
Will there be positive, negative, or no feedbacks between these impacts, and how we should, de uh, we should deal with the risk and try to mitigate it? So to deal with this challenge, we basically take uh, the, the, uh, a, a number of steps, a gradual number of steps. Typically, when you have a problem, you try to observe and understand the physics. And then you translate these physics into mathematical or sometimes, if you need, computational models to, to, to uh, see how they play out and interact. And finally, for the urban areas, you would maybe want to parameterize them into simple models that can be coupled to models of the atmosphere, lithosphere, cryosphere, hydrosphere, or biosphere. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of our work in each of these domains. So we're going to start with observations and understanding of the physics of the urbosphere. Now, the problem with cities, they're very heterogeneous. So this is a picture of Manhattan in the visible range. And this is an infrared picture of Manhattan that gives you the surface temperature. And you see that there's a lot of variability in surface temperature, as you can expect. If you do air quality measurement in Manhattan, also you're going to see a lot of difference in urban, uh, in urban air quality. These are actual measurements from a sensor network. And the size of the red ball and its color are telling you how, how high the concentration is. So in many cases in cities, you take a measurements and you want to understand what, is, what are the urban attributes, building height, number of cars that are influencing air quality at this point. So you can define what we call the environmental neighborhood uh, as the area that is influencing, uh, influencing environmental quality at a given point. So for example, it would be this yellow circle. And it's easy to define a concept. A more challenging aspect or, uh, or, or challenge is how to basically measure the extent of these environmental neighborhoods. So in this study, what we did is basically we tried to take air quality at all these points and compute their spatial correlation to urban attributes, traffic, uh, trees, building height, in a circle. And then we varied the area of the circle. And so if you analyze now how this correlation vary as a function of the size of the circle for multiple pollutants, you see that there's a peak that is reached. What this peak is telling you is that basically if you use, uh, let's say in this case for road area, if you use the information in a, uh, in a circle that's around, uh, actually in a square in this case, that is one by one kilometer on the sides, you're going to get the highest correlation between the, the road area and, and these pollutants. What this is telling you is that if you use an area that's only your immediate vicinity, you don't have enough information because your environmental conditions are affected by factors outside of this circle. And if you try to go too far, you may be reaching Princeton if you go far enough, and then you're getting information that's irrelevant to your problem. So there's an optimal scale at which to analyze how surface conditions affect atmospheric condition. In this case, for road area is about a kilometer, for traffic count is about a kilometer, for trees is about 200 meters, and for green space uh, is about uh, two, three, four, five, 600 meters. But in general, for all of these parameters that we used for multiple pollutants and for other drivers I'm not showing here, we showed that for air quality, these neighborhoods tend to range between 200 and 1,000 kilometers. With that, now that you are able to establish what is the footprint that you need to use, you can uh, more robustly relate a range of environmental attributes to various pollutants. I'm only going to show two in this case, PM2.5 and NO2. And you see that basically, all of the uh, uh, attributes related to in, in imperviousness and building increase are positively correlated with, uh, with uh, uh, particulate matter and NO2, which are really driven by traffic in New York. And tree cover are, and uh, green uh, surfaces are anti-correlated, meaning they uh, tend to tell you that the, uh, the, the uh, air pollution will be lower. And this is a correlation. This is not a causation yet. OK. Now, we want to do a little bit more of a causation, right? We, you want to understand the drivers. And specifically, we are very interested in traffic because it's the source of a lot of pollutants in cities. And so, like many people, we use the COVID lockdown experiment to basically try to understand how the reduced traffic would improve air quality in the city. And we specifically want to uh, have something that's usable or generalizable. So we try to measure elasticity defined as the uh, basically concentration reduction divided by the traffic reduction. So output over input percent reduction. 
And in this case, we basically studied a neighborhood scale uh, data from London. And you see the data points and you see the error bars. And we co combined it with a meta-analysis of 12 other cities in the literature, plotting change in contaminant concentration versus change in traffic. And the ratio, again, is the elasticity. Now, you'd notice if you were along this line, there is no benefit. So you can change your traffic, but there's no change in the concentration. Along this line, this is the maximum plausible benefit you expect. This is the one-to-one -one line. So you're saying, if I uh, drop my traffic by 50%, my concentration are going to drop by 50%, meaning all your NO2 and PM are coming from traffic, which tends not to be the case. So indeed, a lot of the data that we collected, except this, uh, for this outlier, fall in this range. And what we observe is that across all of these studies, the elasticity for NO2 was about 0.71, meaning if you reduce your traffic by 10%, you reduce your NO2 concentration by about 7%. And for PM2.5, it's slightly less related to traffic. There are other sources. It was about 0.56%. Now, this is all basically looking at uh, 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 a lot of these are basically looking at city scale uh, data, except our London study. But often, we, you want to understand variability within a city to understand uh, uh, questions related to environmental justice and to understand, again, what are the drivers and how they vary with the city. For the, so for this analysis, basically, we're building our own little kits of sensing stations that have air quality sensor, uh, particulate matter, CO2, temperature, relative humidity. They're autonomous. They have a solar panel and a wireless uh, wireless device to basically send the data over, over, the, uh, uh, over the cell phone network. And they have very strong magnetic legs. So they're completely plug and play. You just put them on any metallic car. Unfortunately, it turns out the Princeton buses are uh, fiber, uh, are some sort of fiber. So when we tried to put them, they wouldn't stick. And then you knock and you realize, damn. Well, <laughs> you know. But at least the buses in Seoul and the cars that we drove are, are, are metallic, so, so they stick. And basically, we can go around and collect data in Seoul, Manhattan, and Princeton. And because I'm in Princeton, I'm going to show you the Princeton data. So this is a, an average of multiple trips collected on the afternoon of July 19. And obviously, you know the area. So if you travel on Route 1 between Washington and Harrison, there's a lot of traffic. You see very high concentration of CO2 all the way along Route 1, much less in Princeton. PM2.5 tend to be actually also quite uh, emitted by cars. So you see a lot of concentration here. But also, it's emitted by braking and tires. So high concentration along Washington, but not along some of the other corridors. PM10 tends to be heavier, so it doesn't travel a lot. So this peak, I think, was related to early uh, work that uh, they were digging for the Lake Campus. There was some work uh, being done in that time. So I think it's coming from construction. And temperature is high along Route 1 because of, of uh, all the vehicles. But it's also very high when you have big parking lots at the shopping center and close to the Dinky and New South. You have these big uh, parking lots that heat up uh, the surface and then heat the air. And you see these peak in temperature. So you start seeing very fine grain urban environmental uh, variability. Now, this type of technologies also will allow to uh, basically monitor how the future is going to look like. So there's a big shift in uh, mobility that's under, uh, uh, that's, uh, under, that's uh, uh, ongoing right now with autonomy and connectivity, which might be a little bit slow to come, sharing, electrification, and micromobility. And basically, uh, 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 technologies like MUST will allow you to benefit how uh, uh, basically, these technologies, as they roll out, will improve your urban environment. And this is something that we're working on with uh, some colleagues in Princeton and uh, at, at uh, other regional universities to basically be able to develop monitoring and modeling, tech modeling approaches to understand these drivers. So I'm going to shift now from observing to developing mathematical compute and computational models of these physics. So now, it turns out that the most important physical law you need to understand have been around for, for uh, decades and centuries. It's basically the first law of thermodynamic, conservation of energy. You really, this is the most essential feature to understand urban heat islands. So if you basically take any roof or any surface, there's some shortwave radiation coming from the sun and some long wave coming from the sky and the clouds. 
coming onto the roof, and then some of these are reflected and emitted, and you end up with some net radiation that's a net source of energy to your roof. That energy will seep into your building through the ground heat flux QG, and some of it will be uh, conveyed to the air, so the roof will heat up, and then the air next to it will, will heat up. This is sensible heating. And then if your roof is wet, some of it will be consumed to evaporate the water vapor molecule and break the hydrogen bonds. So as a result, you end up with, a, if you think of a very thin interface that have no ability to store a lot of energy, you end up with a very simple energy in is equal to energy out statement. Now, this is the simplest form for one facet. You apply it for uh, every facet, for the green roof, for the black roof, for the wall, for the grounds, for the trees, and you apply uh, energy conservation everywhere. And basically, you have these resistances that tell you about what the flow is doing and how much exchange of energy or water vapor you're going to have between the surface and the atmosphere. And you end up with what we call an urban canopy model. This is a very useful framework, widely used, to describe how cities interact with the atmosphere and how the properties of the city influence the atmosphere. In this case, this is specifically a, a plot of the Princeton urban canopy model because uh, beyond what uh, the urban canopy models that are used in the literature, we basically have implemented very realistic eco-hydrological processes. We resolve urban sub-facets, meaning the roof can be made of 10, 20, how many, as many as you want type of different material. Uh, we change the conduction in the wall to analytical scheme that's more, uh, uh, more accurate. And we basically calibrated the material properties with observations that we collected actually over the Princeton campus. So we developed this model, a very simple representation of cities, and then you want to see uh, basically how it, uh, it fares. So you do model evaluation. Uh, in this case, we are measuring temperature of the surface over asphalt, concrete, and vegetation. The markers are the measurements, and the lines are the runs of the model. And it seems that the model is capturing the data trends very well. So does that mean the model is good or bad? Um, this is the type of questions I'm surprised that scientists actually ask because it's such a wrong way to ask uh, a, a question about a model. Does it work? Does it not work? Is it good or bad? Uh, the right question to ask is, are the model errors smaller than, uh, much smaller, in fact, than the signal that you're trying to build the conclusion on? So basically, in this case, the, the error of the model are smaller than the differences between the subfaces. So our uncertainty is smaller than the signal. So for our purposes, the model is actually adequate and can be used. Now, how do we use this model? For example, one, up, one way we have been using this model is to try to understand when you introduce very novel technologies and material into the city, what will happen. In this case, I'm showing you an example of a thermochromic material that's going to become black when it's cold, so it's going to absorb a lot of the radiation. And then it's going to become white when uh, things uh, warm up, so it's going to reflect a lot of this radiation. So it works well in the winter and the summer, and you can make uh, or put this uh, model, this material in, in the PUCM and compare it to a, a cool white roof and to a dark roof. And this is a plot of the energy going in and out of the building uh, with a thermochromic roof minus a black roof and a cool roof minus a black roof. So both the cool and thermochromic uh, perform well in the summer relative to a black roof. They allow less energy to go into the building, saving you or on air conditioning. Now, in the winter, the cool roof will have its, a penalty. So heat will escape from the building that you have to compensate for by, by internal heating while the thermochromic roof actually has almost no wintertime penalty because in the winter it will turn black and perform as well as the black roof. So this is the type of technology that would be very important for places like Princeton where we have almost five times the heating demand to cooling demand to basically give you technologies that work well in all seasons. Now, this, is, this was work with a group of Anna Laura Pizzello at Perugia, who's a material scientist who developed all these in interesting, innovative technologies. And then we work with them to implement uh, these in the UCM and evaluate them. And this slide is the work of Chiara Chiatti, who's now a visiting uh, a, a student at, at, uh, in, in my lab. So now we're trying to look an, at fluorescent and phosphorescent materials that, as you know, absorb the light and for fluorescent emitted directly uh, back with a phase shift. For phosphorescent is more interesting because it stores it and emitted with a little bit of delay, which makes the modeling a little bit more tricky, but not so difficult. 
So now we basically, in addition to all the other terms, uh, radiation and sensible and latent, we have this uh, uh, heat uh, sink, which is related to phosphorescent or fluorescent material. So they're going to absorb this energy, and instead of heating the air or the building or, 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 uh, or the roof, they're going to basically store it as, and re-emit it, re it as visible light that can be very useful, for example, um, uh, for nighttime lighting uh, to, to save on lighting. But that's also going to be useful for cooling the city. So for example, you see that for uh, uh, the real material that we test in the lab, if you implement it in the roof, you can reduce the temperature of the roof by about um, uh, one degree compared to a regular roof. And if you can tweak the material and make it a little bit more efficient, you can actually get up to two to two and a half degree of reduction in roof temperature, which is not going to solve your urban heat island problem, but it's actually non-negligible. In fact, no single, uh, no single solution will solve your urban heat island problem. This is why, uh, in, inspired by the wedges of, of uh, Steve and Rob, we've been trying to think of portfolios of wedges of, of cooling the city, where you have a combined uh, UHI and global warming that's going to increase your temperature and time. Forget about these, these are wrong. And then this is the baseline scenario, and you're trying to introduce a, a portfolio of technology that's going to basically try to cool you to where you would want to be. And these technologies should be uh, designed for that geoclimate. They should uh, basically maybe use different mechanisms. So one may be more effective under cloudy condition, the other under uh, sunny condition. They should be cost effective. And they should hopefully have a lot of co-benefits like nighttime lighting and uh, little disbenefit. So again, there's a, a number of these kind of interventions, smart irrigation, uh, green roof, uh, retroreflective facades that we're uh, 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 thinking about. So smart irrigation is uh, especially important in water, uh, uh, basically areas with water limitation. So you irrigate the lawns only if you have a heat wave or if you have an event that is uh, going to uh, 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 exacerbate heat in your uh, environment. So now the last thing is that you can take these models and couple them to models of the atmosphere, lithosphere, cryosphere, and so on to build an Earth system model. And it's, indeed, the UCM that we've been developing is now part of the GFDL model. A, a student in my lab was a postdoc at GFDL and implemented that. And it is actually running in the GFDL model. And we've also uh, coupled it to the weather research and forecasting model to investigate a lot of things. Let's say the UHI uh, dynamics during a heat wave, a cold wave, the effectiveness of green and cool roof. And if you want to uh, basically uh, put green roof or cool roofs in your cities, where well, you should put them spatially. But for this lecture, I want to focus on a simpler modeling strategy that I think is, is, uh, was very interesting. So in this study, what we tried to do is to think of all, of all the uh, infrastructure attribute, population, uh, density, building height, that can create an urban heat island. And of all the climatic factors, precipitation, air temperature, radiation, humidity, that can affect also the, wind, uh, the, the urban heat island intensity. And the bold question that we asked is, can we reduce this to a dependence on two parameters, one related or summarizing all the infrastructure attributes, one summarizing all the climate attributes while maintaining an accuracy that's actually workable and usable. So we use the database of surface uh, temperature difference, so surface urban heat island uh, that was developed across the world. And we started again with a very simple statement of energy conservation, the surface energy budget. <clears throat> Same as before, but now with uh, the, the different symbols and with uh, uh, the, the anthropogenic heat emission. So you start with this equation, and then you can actually uh, take, let me go back for a second, you can take this equation, write it for an urban surface and a rural surface, and then take the difference of the two. When you take the difference of the two, you can develop a model delta Ts, that's the difference between urban minus rural surface temperature, as a, as a functional uh, equation that, that has a form like that, and when the three dots are basically representing all these 10, 20, 30 inputs, climatic and infrastructure inputs that would be needed for this model. And up till here, actually, this is basically a, a surface energy budget with minimal uh, assumptions. Now, so far, this is just a purely physical model. Now, the big question that we asked is, can you actually 
take uh, every um, uh, every in, uh, uh, urban uh, infrastructure attribute and write it as some empirical function of the population of the city. In this case, for example, uh, the, in this study, they showed that the average height of the building tend to have a good power law relation to the log of the to the population, right? So this is a log log plot. Um, uh, similarly, for example, the net short wave uh, average over uh, the eight hours of the day. In this study, we showed that it can be related to, uh, the, uh, to the precipitation uh, using basically an exponential decaying uh, law that ends up looking like that. So now if you take every uh, infrastructure uh, and write uh, uh, input and write it as a function of population and every climate and write it as a function of precipitation, you end up with a model where precipitation and population are the only inputs that you would need. The question is, of course, uh, would this model uh, have sufficient accuracy to say anything useful about how the world works? Now, you need to remember that this model is not for Princeton or for New York. This is not for a specific city. This is like a coarse-grained model. Coarse-grained model, think about a little bit of thermodynamics. The temperature is the average coarse-grained property that tells you about the energy content of, of the molecules or atoms, right? And in the same way, this law does not predict a single city. Cities will basically spread across the, 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 the model. But it tells you about the macroscopic average behavior of groups of cities as you change their population and precipitation. So now the test is, of course, to compare this to, to, to observations. So these are the observations from the data set I talked about. These are two different implementation of the model as a function of precipitation. Indeed, it seems the model is actually able to capture the trend with precipitation very well. And both with precipitation and population, we find nonlinear uh, sensitivity uh, uh, of the urban heat island to these uh, parameters. Specifically, uh, in this case, for example, if you're uh, a city in a very dry rural environment, you're in this region here, and you observe that you might even get a negative urban heat island, so an urban cool island, because your city is going to be maybe whiter and wetter than the surroundings. On the other hand, if you're in a city uh, that is surrounded by a very rural wet terrain that receives a lot of precipitation, your surrounding terrain evapor transpire a lot and cools a lot, and that makes your city hotter by up to 1.5 degrees. Now, you'd notice but that beyond a certain value of P, the, the urban heat island doesn't continue increasing, because beyond that, the evaporation in the surrounding area saturate, because it's becoming energy limited rather than water limited. This is the Budico framework for those who uh, uh, who are hydrologists, and basically we, we see its manifestation in this law. So um, I'll hurry up a little bit. I'm almost done. So now the, the, the useful thing about this model is that you can basically take any city for which you have no observations and basically say something about the type of, uh, of mitigation measure that might be efficient. So for example, this is a plot of the cooling uh, um, uh, or uh, sorry, this is a plot of the urban heat island intensity at the surface, uh, depending on the urban green cover in your city and your mean annual precipitation, that you would basically uh, obtain uh, again using this model. So you would observe that if you're in a wet area, if you go from zero greenery in your city to 100% greenery in your city, you basically cool about one degree, which is useful. But if you're in a very dry area, you go from zero to basically 100% uh, greenery, and you can cool by uh, basically 1.5 to 2 degree, which is almost double. So what this is telling us is, for example, green infrastructure is going to be much more effective in Las Vegas uh, or Phoenix than in Raleigh or, uh, or Pittsburgh. So this is useful because it's, it's, it's not only a model that's kind of describing or predicting what will happen or even diagnosing why things will happen, this is what we call a prescriptive model. So you can actually tweak the model input and say something about how the world would look like if those changes were made in the real world. So this is what we call a prescriptive model, and this is the type of models that we need for urban planning. And these type of coarse-grained models are useful um, because um, uh, by the year 2100, as you see in this evolving video, a lot of the, the all the biggest cities in the world will be in Africa and sub uh, in Africa and uh, South Asia. 
And these are cities for which we have very little data and very little studies. And these coarse grained models will allow you to say something uh, uh, that is useful to urban planning in these cities that basically have uh, uh, very little data. So with that, I need to thank the uh, funders that paid for this work and of course the people who did the real work, my students, uh, especially in this, uh, as, uh, in this uh, presentation. It was the work of Maider, Jiwa, Dan, Jashwan, and Yonghee, but there's a lot of other students in my lab who are doing great work. And collaborators, especially with uh, Anna Laura Pizzello and, and uh, her, her group, and with a bunch of collaborators uh, uh, also that uh, contributed uh, a lot of idea and sweat and effort to this work. So thank you very much, and I'll leave you with something I didn't talk about what we work quite a bit on, which is urban fluid mechanics. So you see that decisions as simple as the shape of the roof can influence uh, urban ventilation. This is a video that goes from a round to an angle to a flat roof, and you see that the shape of the roof have a lot of impact on uh, uh, street ventilation. So these little design decisions have huge real world impact. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Ellie. And um, we now open for questions, and I have noted Safan, but I would, I, would, I would ask that the first question come from a student, please. Gabe, uh, wait for the mic, because we have a, uh, a remote audience as well. And then now, Stefan is after. Thanks, Gabe, and thanks, Ellie. Um, so the presentation was great. I guess I'm curious, and you presented this in the, I think, third to last slide. So a lot of these cities, they're moving increasingly coastal. So I just wanted to know what effect, um, I guess, you know, sea land interactions or the sea recirculation has on, um, you know, your model, your observations. Uh, yeah. any I, I, I can give you a one hour lecture about sea breeze. Uh, in fact, a student in my lab just defended his uh, PhD looking exactly at that. It's extremely important and it's also highly misunderstood because the pictures or theoretical model we have of sea breeze is of a steady state circulation uh, with no geostrophic synoptic forcing, right? The reality is the sea breeze, uh, if you have a city or something else on the land side, is going to be different. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the diurnal cycle has a long memory and the synoptic conditions are very important. So what, what we know is that sea breeze is very important. So for example, in New York, you see the cooling uh, effect during the day. And you see the, the opposite effect during the night because the, the, it, it basically reverses. So it's, it's, it's extremely important and people are studying it. Um, it is, uh, it's something that where there are so many variables that it's mainly maybe uh, not useful to try to come up with a generalizable theoretical framework. But basically, and for this problem, the question is, how can we simulate it well in weather and climate models so that it's, it's this complex effects and their interactions are captured? But it's extremely important. OK, thank you very much for this very nice talk. My question concerns um, basically that right, the heat stress is, is not only temperature, but also humidity. And I'm interested in kind of why, um, you know, maybe there is a reason, but right, so in, in principle, obviously kind of, yeah, we want to have less energy in, so that's obvious. But evaporation kind of on a larger scale never helps. The heat stress is largest in, in the moistest regions. And so what we would need to have is sort of a, a separation of scales for humidity and sensible heat. Um, yeah, what, what so, do people think about that? So there is a solution for this, which actually we, we, we have implemented in a way. So in fact, we, we, uh, I, I didn't draw the human, but we have put a, an actual human in, in, the urban, uh, in these urban canopy models. So we have a human that's basically okay, represented as a five cylinders, five sections of a cylinder. And basically, you model the human as the core, uh, which has a temperature, and the outer uh, skin, which has a temperature, and the interfacial skin. And you can model the uh, thermal exchanges uh, uh, in terms of radiation, 
convection and the effect of moisture and all of that. And it turns out that the main driver is radiation. Not humidity, not air temperature, radiation. So surface temperature is extremely important. So we put white walls and white walls cool the air, but they made the thermal balance of the person way worse. So radiation is the primary driver. Now, whether it's temperature or relative humidity, that's most, more important. Uh, uh, yes, so the, the hotter you are, the more humidity becomes a, an important factor in some of these thermal stress models. Uh, but uh, it, it's, uh, so uh, in, in general, I would say that my, my uh, intuition that uh, I, we still need to prove it is that actually green infrastructure will still help. Uh, because the, uh, the, the, the ratio or the increase in the humidity of green infrastructure uh, is going to be offset potentially by the decrease in the air temperature and in the shading uh, uh, that it offers to pedestrian in the street. So if you take the shading and the effect of air temperature, it becomes a no-brainer. If you only take the air temperature, then I think this depends on, okay, if you're in Phoenix, you increase humidity by 10%, it's no big deal. If you go to Phoenix and you walk, you feel very good when you're walking through those misters. If you're in a place like, uh, you know, Singapore or Miami uh, with already high humidity, if you increase it further, then I think there whether, you know, the balance on human comfort between air temperature and humidity becomes maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit more questionable. But in dry areas, a 10-20% increase in humidity will be way offset by the cooling of the air, I think. But again, this is something that's not settled, so, so I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> yes. Okay, we have, a, we have an online question from Anu uh, Ramaswamy. Um, Anu asks, uh, can you speak more about broad options, so, you know, when you're discussing about design options, um, relevant to developing nations? Uh... Yes, uh, so, uh, so developing nations, uh, uh, you know, so, so shading solutions can be very useful, but maybe, for example, trees are, uh, there's no space and uh, basically no uh, funds and water to take care of the green infrastructure. So green infrastructure may be not the best option, but you can think of other shading solutions that are already, for example, used in North Africa, which are these kind of uh, street covers that uh, basically shade people from the sun in the middle of the day to increase uh, thermal comfort. And I have a postdoc that now thinking of kind of novel uh, structures, origami, uh, kirigami structure for these like uh, street covers that would stop the sun but actually continue to allow ventilation. So you can think of, of uh, shading solutions that maybe do not involve trees. Uh, you can think of low cost paint, for example, there's an incoming professor in Princeton, Jyotir Moy Mandal, uh, and Jyoti is basically developing these very low cost uh, uh, paints that basically will, high very, will have very high reflectivity and uh, also that would emit in the atmospheric window where their emissions actually will, will go, go to outer space. So, so low cost solutions like that, uh, uh, those are the two that come to mind uh, right away. Uh, uh, you know, again, fans can, fans can be extremely important because uh, uh, let's say uh, often what you have in these uh, 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 construction in, 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 uh, in developing country is a, a, a construction that maybe has a, some thermal mass uh, uh, that will basically heat up a lot during the day uh, but will not cool at night. So basically what you can do is have fans to ventilate these, these spaces without the need for air conditioning. Uh, these are some of the solutions, but certainly these solutions have be, to be tailored uh, to those countries. So, you know, some places in Africa are going to be very different than India. But those are some of the basic uh, or simple ideas that come to mind. Wen Cheng? Yeah, and a very nice talk. Um, um, it looks like the urbanization can have very large local impact. My question is to what, what extent is urbanization can like impact remote climate, for example, by pertur perturbing the atmospheric circulation. So one region of urbanization can so impact. Directly it can't. There's no direct, I mean, the urban heat island has a regional impact. It will not change the global circulation directly. Indirectly, it has a huge effect because cities are emitting all the greenhouse gases 
and uh, basically consuming all the resources and, and using all the water. So at an at a indirect global scale, is, it has a huge impact. Direct, you know, you put a big city and then it changes the, it perturbs the healthy cell. That's not, there's no proof of that. And just if you do simple calculations, it's, it's highly unlikely that it would have an impact beyond the regional impact. So, so the plume of pollution from Beijing travels far, the urban heat island of, of DC uh, travels to Baltimore, but it's a regional impact. There's no direct global impact to urbanization that I am aware of and that I think anybody has shown. So I'm going to take a little prerogative. So Ellie, you and I and Wen Chang need to talk because okay. we might have found something and we're very confused about it. But um, so um, a, a, a question I have for you is, is the, the relationship between sort of, uh, uh, sort of people's preferences in some of these solutions. I mean, if you look in, in, in the United States, there is a, an aesthetic for buildings in which you have the walls, the outer walls tend to be light colored and the roofs tend to be dark. That's what people like when the Toll Brothers, you know, build a house, that's what it looks like. And from the point of view of energy efficiency, it's the least efficient design. In winter, the sun is coming in at an angle, you'd want either big windows or a dark wall. And in summer, the sun's coming in overhead and you'd want reflective roofs. And, and so, so what are, are there sociological and, and aesthetic uh, limitations that, that are first order in, in, in dealing with this urban heat island? Yeah, so th this is a fantastic question and it actually ties back to Anu's question, right? When you think about uh, solutions for cities in developing countries, uh, you really need to go and understand kind of the, the aesthetic uh, and, and other motivation of people to accept or not accept something rather than to kind of uh, dictate it. Um, I think that the problem is that uh, aesthetics is uh, changes in time and it's basically there's no uh, rules on that, right? And so a, uh, previously a colleague here in architecture was saying that it's the job of architects to convince people that the aesthetic uh, that they want is really one that is kind of uh, uh, environmentally friendly. So I think, uh, you know, so, so I don't know if there's architects here, uh, but, but uh, uh, certainly the, you know, the, the drive for big window is, is interesting. For example, the engineering gravity here has big windows, but like the, sh the shades are always closed. So I don't know what's the purpose of these windows. Uh, so, so I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have a, 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 a great uh, answer here, except to say that uh, I think it is a, a little bit also the aesthetics of the wind farm that we were just talking about. People have to start liking uh, the image of a, or, or the view of, of a wind turbine, as well as the, the view of a building that maybe uh, does not have a, a uh, you know, a ton of window or that, uh, you know, has a color that's not appropriate for the climate. This also is a problem in many developing countries, uh, again, um, because basically, for example, you go to Quito in, uh, in, in Ecuador, and basically they imported the European architectural type, which is nice, they liked it, they were European immigrants, but it's so ill-suited for Quito. So, so when you import ar architectural designs from uh, one place to the other, sometimes the result can be uh, quite difficult. And I think the solution is with architects to can, convince us all that, that uh, tell us what we should like, you know. <laughs> just, thank you, I just wanna pick up on your brief mention of environmental justice and then come back to the end of your talk about how the considerations for Las Vegas and for Raleigh and your examples would be really different with this model findings in mind. So in the environmental justice literature for a long time, there's been an attention to the distribution of park space and green infrastructure at the neighborhood level in terms of the consequences for respiratory health and social and psychic well-being. Um, so in this work and in your broader collaboration, are you considering both that kind of consideration, how the distribution of new infrastructure right, can be attended to with environmental equity in mind, but also urban ecological considerations of habitat for other species? Like are these things that are in the mix of the broader context for this work, I guess? Yeah. So, so in terms of eco ecological habitats, that's not something I have looked at a lot, but you know, uh, uh, others have. 
In terms of uh, environmental equity, we've, we've done a little bit of work on that. And it's not only, uh, in terms of environmental equity in cities, it's not only uh, basically the urban heat island and the air quality. There are so many aspects where this is a problem. Uh, this is a problem that is, is historic because of redlining uh, and, and other policies. And it's a problem that is difficult to solve. For example, uh, I, I always thought that, uh, you know, uh, Low-income neighborhoods tend to be hotter because they uh, are more dense and have no space for green infrastructure. Uh, a colleague of mine in UC uh, Riverside recently was showing that actually, uh, in analysis of, of Los Angeles, even when you go to uh, neighborhoods that are high and low income, with the same lot size and, and the same everything, the low income uh, had just sand in the backyard because they had no money for the landscaping and the water compare that to the basically richer neighborhoods that were cooler because they had the money to have green infrastructure. So uh, there's a lot of evidence that actually even when you uh, correct for uh, density and some of the physical factors, we also did an analysis of air quality in LA that showed that there's still a uh, anti-correlation uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, pollutant concentration with income when we controlled for everything you think you should control for, density and other things. Uh, so it's, it's, a, uh, it's a significant problem, and I think the, the way forward is to basically realize that, uh, you know, the, the neighborhoods that need interventions, that need more trees, uh, are not necessarily, uh, well, it's not about kind of planting trees all over the city. You really have to focus on these neighborhoods where, uh, I mean, you see in, in urban heat and pollution, you see huge gradients between uh, different neighborhoods in, in all American cities. Um, and the question now becomes, okay, so what type of interventions, going back to, to Gabe, uh, Gabe's uh, 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 question. So for example, with smart cities, right? So, so there's a lot of examples of uh, cities that, uh, you know, wanted to introduce all these uh, range of technologies and the inhabitants just did not buy it, right? Uh, in, in Mexico, in Toronto, and in other places. So you really have to kind of uh, go talk to the uh, inhabitants, co-produce these solutions with them. So for example, you know, if you help them plant trees, will they have the water and the time to irrigate those trees? So you really need solutions that are suitable for those neighborhoods. Uh, and that's a, that's a big challenge. And uh, you're starting from an initial condition that's kind of, uh, pretty inequitable, and, and it, it needs a lot of work. Yeah. So I'm going to take one question here, and then the next question. Uh, so uh, Benjamin Leroy asks, uh, any idea of the expected future contribution of UHI with respect to global warming, especially for developing cities, uh, since GCMs, EC ESMs represent cities uh, relatively poorly? Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, okay, so uh, UHI is, is uh, again, um, uh, uh, so far there's no evidence of a direct uh, global scale impact. But for example, there's estimate that the existence of a UHI in London increases cooling demand by 40% because it's just hotter, right? And so you take that and the existence of a UHI will have energy uh, implications, which will have greenhouse gas implications, which then will feed back to, you know, have this, having this, uh, or exacerbating this, this global, uh, uh, global impact of cities. Uh, was that the question or did I, did I miss some aspect? Um, I guess. I, I think that the, the, the full answer would take another two hours. Okay. <laughs> so. Eli, thank you for this wonderful talk. Are there city governments that have coordinated programs along the lines that you are proposing? City so, governments. City governments? Yeah. Uh, so city governments are, are very interested in, in, uh, in heat and humidity uh, and, and flooding and all of these challenges. And even, uh, let's say, uh, Anchorage, Alaska, uh, was uh, interested in extreme heat. They think that, you know, in a, in a decade or two, uh, without a, any air conditioning infrastructure, even they will start suffering from, from uh, those impacts. Uh, now, um, uh, so, so cities are, are, but cities don't, uh, most cities except New York, don't have the means 
to basically develop their own studies. So you go to cities like New York and they have the means to, they have the scientists to work with universities and the scientists to collect the data and do their own analysis. So there's really a big disparity between cities that have the means to develop these policies and send people to talk to professors and all of that and cities that don't. Now, uh, engaging with cities is, is a, is a, uh, uh, is a uh, is important. It's a it's a long term effort. I think, uh, for example, in Princeton, Anura Maswami, who was asking a question, has done that much more intensively than than uh, than I did. Uh, but let's say uh, you know, with New York, uh, with Philadelphia, with Baltimore, we've had a lot of exchanges with with city governments that were uh, were, were interested in the results. Um, uh, so so the answer is is uh, yes, they are. Uh, a lot of them have the means to do a lot, and a lot of them, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you talk to them, uh, uh, you know, have a problem of just balancing their budget and are not worrying about climate change. So when we did a workshop here in 2019 to launch the Metropolis Project, uh, we had a bunch of city representatives from New Jersey, the range of concerns where uh, there was a huge disparity, again, related to income. Uh, whether, where some cities, you know, issues of climate change and sea level rise and heat were very low because they had much more dire direct uh, concerns and others that had uh, uh, luxury because at this point it it's almost remains a luxury for these cities to, to worry about what will happen uh, 10, 20 years down the line. So, I, you know, that's, that's the answer I have, so. All right, well. So, um, Ellie, I'm going to close with this answer and, and thank you again. Um, and uh, I'll thank the online and in-person audience for your attention. And um, what I'll bring your attention to as well is mark your calendars. February 7th of the next year will be our first faculty seminar series, TBD. Um, but uh, there will be free lunch. Not only will it be free, but you will also be given the reward of interesting uh, presentation and new knowledge. So with that, uh, let's thank Ellie again.